What's going on guys? The CTA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be putting together a $350 gaming PC. This is going to be a three part series. The first part, the video you're watching now, is the build. The next video in the series will be benchmarking this unit, testing out some gameplay and applications to see how this thing performs. And then finally, for part three, we'll add a dedicated GPU to this system so we can up the game. So if you're watching this in the future, make sure you check the description for part two and three. So basically what we have here is a $350 lower end gaming PC with tons of upgradability down the road. For instance, you can always add a dedicated GPU to a system like this, or you could upgrade the CPU down the road to a 2600 or a 2700 Ryzen. But for this build, we're going to be using the Ryzen 3 2200G APU. The CPU comes in at $99 and recently it was on sale for $80 on Amazon. This has four cores with four threads, base clock of 3.5 GHz, boost clock of 3.7, four megabytes of L3 cache, and an onboard Radeon Vega 8 GPU with the clock up to 1100 megahertz. And we can overclock the CPU and GPU portion of this unit quite a bit. I will leave Amazon links in the description for everything I'm using here. Tons of motherboard options for a chip like this and these micro ATX boards go for around the same price, 74, 75 bucks. I chose the Gigabyte B450M DS3H I've just personally had really good luck with Gigabyte motherboards, that's why I chose this. And if you're searching around for a better price motherboard, you're going to run across the B350s. I would stay away from them because the older ones that came off the floor aren't updated for the Ryzen APUs. You will have to get a compatible CPU, then upgrade the BIOS. You're better off starting with a B450. These Ryzen APUs perform much better with faster RAM, so I'm using 3000 MHz Vengeance LPX. This is 8GB, two 4GB sticks. I picked this up for $58 on Amazon recently, but unfortunately the price on this has gone up to about $70, so I'm recommending something else here. Same amount of RAM, same speed, it's just made by Patriot. This is the Viper 4 series, 3000 MHz, $58. You're definitely going to want to add more storage down the road, but to get you started, you can always use a 240 gigabyte Kingston A400 SSD. These come in at $30, and I've had really good luck with these drives. You could always add a couple of these drives or just use this drive for your Windows 10 installation and use a 1 terabyte Western Digital Blue 3.5. They're relatively cheap, but for this build, we're trying to keep the price down, so I'm going to be going with this. For the case, I chose the Thermaltake Versa H17. Now this doesn't have any tempered glass on it. You could always splurge and get something that looks a little better, but I love the minimalistic design of this. I don't need any flashy RGB on my PC at all. This will get the job done. It's a tough case and I think it looks pretty sleek. And finally, the power supply. I went with a 500 watt thermal take because we will be adding a dedicated GPU to the system later on down the road. If you're not planning on adding a dedicated GPU, you can get away with a 150 watt power supply with the 2200G. 500 watts is definitely overkill just for this APU, but if you want to do any upgrading down the road, I do recommend at least a 400 watt. Total cost on this full build? 347 US dollars. Now you could get out a little cheaper, about $30 if you go with a power supply case combo from Newegg. But personally, I wanted a decent looking case and I wanted my power supply to last more than a year and a half. So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and put this thing together. So like always, we're going to be starting with the motherboard here. This is a Gigabyte B450M DS3H. There's not a lot of bells and whistles here, but this will definitely get us by with gaming and everyday tasks. It's plenty for what we need. We do have PCIe X16, and like I mentioned, this is a three-part series. We will be utilizing this to its fullest later on down the road. We also have X1 and X4. This board does contain an M.2 slot for an M.2 SSD if you want to use that, but for me I'm going to be using a 2.5 inch SSD, so we're not going to be using that in this video. As for the I.O., we have our audio in and out, two USB 2.0 ports, Gigabit Ethernet, four USB 3.0 ports, HDMI, DVI, a PS2 port, and two more USB 2.0 ports. The first thing we want to start with is the CPU. Now these boards come with the older AM4 mounting bracket system. We will have to remove this, so you're going to need a Phillips head screwdriver. Since we're using the included Wraith cooler, it's not going to support that old mounting system. On the back of the board, you will notice this steel mounting plate. We're going to need to keep this in place. It will detach from the board when we remove the old mounting brackets. 
But first thing I want to do is place the CPU in the socket. So I'm just going to raise up the locking lever. And remember, the CPU only goes in one way. On the socket itself, there is a little arrow. We're going to need to line up this arrow with the arrow that's located on the CPU itself. It's really easy to do. Got a close up here for you. So just make sure you have the arrows lined up. This is a drop in socket. No force whatsoever is required. You're just going to drop it right in and we're going to close the lever. The CPU is now inserted into the motherboard. Now I'm going to remove the old AM4 bracketing system because like I said, we're using the Wraith cooler. It's just four Phillips head screws and the back plate is going to remain in place as long as we have this on a steady surface. And now it's time for our CPU cooler. These do come with pre-applied thermal paste and I recommend using that. But I've previously used this cooler and CPU so I've cleaned up the old thermal paste that was on this. And I'll be using some Noctua NTH2 thermal paste. I've tried Thermal Grizzly. I've tried a lot of them. I personally prefer this. Plus I had a couple tubes left over. I personally use a little dab in the middle. Never had any issues. Built tons of different systems. You'll find thousands and thousands of different ways to apply your thermal paste, but I find that this is the easiest, and in my experience, the most effective. Mounting the cooler is relatively easy, but with these Wraith coolers, there's a little nub on the side here with the AMD logo. Sometimes, on some motherboards, it will block off a RAM slot. So I'm going to be placing it to the left-hand side of the board. You can try it either way, but it only goes two ways. It'll go to the right or to the left. I'm just going to line up two of the screws on the cooler with two of the studs on the back plate on the upper side of the motherboard. When I place it down, the other two should be lined up. Now when tightening this down, you don't need to use a lot of force. I usually place a little bit of force at first and I start all four screws. I do this in a cross pattern so I have everything evenly snug down. The cooler is now mounted. It's time to plug in the CPU fan. On pretty much every motherboard, you will have a CPU fan labeled connector. That's where I'm going to plug this right into. I'm going to try to tidy up the length of this cable a little bit, and it looks pretty good. Now it's time to insert our RAM. Like I mentioned, I'm using this Corsair Vengeance LPX 3000 MHz DDR4 RAM. As you can see, there are four slots on this board, but we're only going to be utilizing two of them for dual channel. On every board, it will be marked. I'm not sure if you can see it here, but the RAM slots are numbered. So we have number one, number three, number two, and number four. Basically, if you're only using two RAM sticks, you want number one and two. So on this board, we're going to be using the two gray slots. The RAM can only be inserted one way. So make sure you have the notch in the middle lined up. You will have to apply a little bit of force. Just make sure the notch is lined up. When it's inserted completely and correctly, the notches will lock in place. So that's it. We now have our CPU, our cooler, and our RAM installed. That's pretty much all we need to do for the motherboard outside of the case. We still have a little ways to go, but we need to move the case in because we have to mount the motherboard in the case before we do anything else. All right, so now it's time to mount the motherboard inside of the case. I've taken both panels off. This is the front and this is the rear of the case, if that's how you want to look at it. You will have a mess of wires back here. This is our front I.O. or USB, power button reset, LEDs, all that good stuff. You're also going to need to locate the mounting hardware that came with your case. This is everything we need to mount the motherboard inside of the case. It even comes with some extra zip ties and our SSD mounts. This particular case just came with a couple bags. Some cases come with boxes mounted inside of a hard drive bay, so look around if you can't find it. It should be there. I usually just separate these out so I have easy access to them. I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Then we'll mount this motherboard. Again, you're going to need a Phillips head screwdriver for this. We're also going to need to find the motherboard I.O. plate. So this is going to go in the back of the case. And we kind of want to make sure we have it lined up correctly. So just take a look at how you're going to mount it. This just pops into the opening on the back side of the case. Make sure you're not putting pressure on the middle of the plate, but on the outer edges. So this still isn't in there. I'm going to hold the case itself, kind of snap it in. There we go. So my IO plate is now installed. It's time to install the motherboard. So I just get all of the cables out of the way, 
in the front here, we only have this rear fan cable to worry about. We will plug this in after we get everything mounted up. I'm going to grab the motherboard by the heatsink itself, place it in here. Make sure you have the I.O. lined up with all of the ports on the board. This one fits really nice in here. The studs actually have these little protrusions, so they come up through the mounting holes on the board. So when everything's in place, you should definitely know it. Now it's just a matter of bolting the motherboard down. So you might not use every single hole on the motherboard itself. Some cases will utilize all of them. This one here only uses five. The board's not going to go anywhere. Five screws in here is going to be plenty to hold this in place. And just like every other screw on this PC, just snug it down. You do not need to torque them down super tight. So now that your motherboard's mounted, it's time to install the power supply. I mean, you could really do this in any order, but I usually put the motherboard in first, then I install the power supply. Now it's time to mount the power supply. I hate these non-modular power supplies, but if you want to get by cheap, you're probably going to have to use one unless you find a really good sell on the EVGA 550B. Your power supply and motherboard should come with mounting hardware. It'll just be four screws to hold this in place. You're also going to need a Phillips head screwdriver. With this case, the power supply is going to be mounted on the lower level. Some people refer to this as a power supply basement. The PSU fan will be facing down. The case itself does have a little mesh filter on the bottom to catch a, a little bit of dust. It's not the best in the world, but it should help out. We're just going to slide it right in the compartment here. And this power supply does have a few different mounting holes. You're just going to want to line it up and put your four screws in. I mean, it's really as simple as that. Like I've mentioned several times, this doesn't need to be super tight. You don't want to strip anything out. Now that the power supply is mounted, we're going to go ahead and get all the cables ready. For now, we're going to be focusing on two main cables. The 24 pin power, or 20 plus 4, whatever you want to call it. This will go right into the motherboard. And we'll also need our 8 pin CPU power. So if we take a look at the case up in the top right hand corner, if you're looking at it from the back, there should be a little cutout. We're going to slide our CPU power cable in here. And as for the 30 pin, it really depends on where the 30 pin is located on your board when it's mounted in the case. Basically, they should be all in the same place, but you might have different cutouts on your case. So as you can see, I slid mine in the first hole. I should have went to the second one. I'll swap it out real quick. That way we can get right to the 30 pin. We're going to plug it in. I do put a little pressure on the back of the board just so I can snug it in there. Make sure she's clamped in and your 30 pins done. As for the 8 pin, it's up in the top left hand corner of the motherboard. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so we can see this. Here's our CPU adapter right up in the top left hand corner. You will have to bend this a little bit. You really don't want to crimp them, but bending them is not going to hurt anything. We're going to plug this right into the 8 pin. And now we have our two main power connectors for the system plugged in. As for the rest of the cabling, I do recommend taking a look at your motherboard's user manual. Everything will be clearly marked. Like this here, this is going to be my system fan, my rear fan. I'm going to go ahead and plug it in here. I will clean up all these wires when I'm done with this. Now this is an easy part, but it's very tedious. We need to plug in all of our front I.O. This is really hard for me to capture on camera, but they're clearly marked on the board, on the connectors, and in your manual. When plugging in your LEDs, they are polarity sensitive, so you need positive to positive and negative to negative. As for the power button and reset switch, they're not polarity sensitive, so you can plug them in either way. Remember that mass of wires around back we haven't unwrapped yet? Well, here they are. The front audio, USB 3.0, and USB 2.0 connectors can only be plugged in one way. They're going to block you if you try to plug them in another way. A case like this is actually pretty decent at cable management. Now remember, you're going to want to take a look at the front and the back to know where you want to route your cables. Like my audio, it's on the bottom left hand corner of the motherboard, so I'm going to run it in through this back cutout. I'm also going to do the same exact thing for my front USB 2.0 connector. For the rest of the cabling, like my USB 3.0, my power button, reset, hard drive LED, and power LED will be run through the front cutout here. Like I said, everything should be clearly marked, the connectors, the motherboard, and you can also reference your user manual. So here's a quick look at everything connected. Like I mentioned, it's really hard to get the camera in here and my hands, so I just had to go ahead and do it and take a few pictures. 
It's super easy, but very tedious. And remember, the LEDs are polarity sensitive, so put your negative to negative and your positive to positive. We're getting real close to being finished here, but we do need to mount our storage. So I'm using this 240 gigabyte Kingston SSD. The case came with hardware for this, and there are several different mounting locations. This case uses a sliding grommet system for these SSDs, and there's one stationary hole. So basically, we're just going to line it up, throw three grommets and screws on the SSD, and slide it into place. So I'm going to mount mine right here. Easy access to the power and data cable. Your motherboard should have come with a couple SATA cables. You can pick which one you want. Some of them are angled, some of them are straight. It's really up to you how you set this up. I just routed my SATA cable, plugged it into the unit, and power from the power supply to the SSD. This is how it looks. All that's left to do is triple check your connections and a little bit of cable management around back. Then we can boot this thing up. For cable management, I use zip ties, but when I run out, I also use the twisty ties that came on all of the cabling. And now it's time for the moment of truth. We need to boot this thing up, but we're also going to have to install our operating system of choice. I'm choosing Windows 10. Recently I made a video on how to create a Windows 10 installation USB drive, so I'll leave a link for that in the description. Got mine set up here, I'm just going to plug it in and boot this thing up. So I have quadruple checked all of my connections. Looks like we're good to go here. It should automatically boot from this USB drive. If it doesn't, you will have to go into your boot menu. And there we have it. Now I just need to install Windows 10. I do like to be connected online while I'm installing this so it downloads most of my updates, but I will have to go to the manufacturer's website to download a few others. And I also need the graphics driver. So I got Windows 10 installed, changed my wallpaper because that gives me more FPS in games. As for my keyboard, I'm using an aw key mechanical keyboard with blue switches. This is the KMG7. I'll leave a link in the description. For the mouse, I'm using a Corsair M65 Pro. This is a great mouse. It's relatively cheap. You can get them for about $30 on Amazon. I also have a little aluminum mouse pad here. It's a no-name Nighthawk. Works fine. If you've never used a good mouse, you will be surprised at how it can up your game in first-person shooters. It's night and day. Like I was saying, I still need to install some drivers, so I head over to my motherboard's manufacturer's website, find my motherboard, download the rest of my drivers. I also like to update my BIOS to the latest version. And then I download my graphics driver, or my GPU driver. In this case, we're using the 2200G, so we head over to AMD's website, choose Processor with Graphics, and find 2200G. We're going to download the latest Adrenaline driver for this, install it, now we can start installing our favorite Steam games. So that's pretty much it for part one. We have a fully built PC with Windows 10 installed. We're up and running now. In part two, I will be doing some benchmarking. I'm going to test out a bunch of games, some applications, and things like that. If there's anything you want to see running on this, let me know in the comments below. Really appreciate you guys watching. Definitely keep an eye on the channel for part two and three. And I also have tons of links for Amazon and Newegg in the description if you're interested in building something like this. If you could, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and like always, thanks for watching.